Okay, so this is the next lecture for today. Distributed systems, uh, distributed object-based systems, where we'll be talking about how you describe sets of objects that have the usual methods and fields, etc., that can be accessed from different machines. Again, I'm not Bjorn, I'm Hugh, uh, and uh, see how this goes. Okay, so today's lecture, we're going to talk about the basic object-oriented concepts for distributed systems, and then spend a bit of time talking about a few different methods that are used to achieve the goals of having object-oriented distributed computing. So, essentially, the idea is this. Let's say that you are doing this in Java, though these facilities exist in other languages as well. Then you are writing your Java program, and you have some object that appears to the user of your system to be just an ordinary Java object. But when you call a method on that object, instead of it being processed locally, it is sent by a, a message is sent to a machine somewhere else, and there is a peer, a remote object, which matches the same object that you have locally, and the method is actually computed on that remote object instead, and the results are sent back to you. The way this works is that you have on the client, which is the person who wants to do the method call, uh, client functions, which are their ordinary functions, and the object that appears locally to be this, uh, the, 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 the local peer of this remote object, has a set of stubbed out functions that have the right prototypes and then call down to network routines, serializing the data, that is the parameters that are needed for the method call, send them over to the appropriate machine, which unpacks those, uh, works out the appropriate parameters that should be put to the actual method that does the work, and in reverse, the return values are packed up again, sent back over to the kernel, unpacked and returned to the client process. So that is essentially how it works. The idea behind all this is that you should be able to use client objects almost as easily as you can local objects, except it turns out that the facilities for do this are normally a, a great big pain in the backside and you have to do quite a lot of work to do it so that generally speaking with most languages and systems that do this you have to think carefully about whether you really want this in the java system um, the rpc the remote the, the remote procedure call is done by converting the java objects down to an xml representation doing that serialization when it is done for sending to somebody else as opposed to just serializing and persisting is often called marshalling. And the reverse of unpacking those objects and data is called unmarshalling. So again, this is just basically exactly the same diagram that we have just seen, just with marshalling and unmarshalling, described more particularly that it belongs to the client stub rather than to the networking layers. So, if you want to achieve these kind of, uh, if you want to achieve this remote procedure call, and then have a bunch of facilities around it that make your life easier, for example, discovering different objects that are available to you on different machines and so forth, then often this is provided by something called middleware. Essentially, all that means is some software facilities that sit between your application and the distributed system. Their goal is simply to make it easier for you to do whatever it is you want to do. Uh, so leadership elections, working out that some object or distributed resource has come online or gone offline, etc. Uh, doing all the routing and if you've got multiple resources managing who they to whom they go, these are done by middleware systems. The web services middle layer 
as discussed previously, sits between the application and the operating system. In the application layer are the services which talk to each other and ask each other for favours or whatever it might be. There is WSDL, which stands for the Web Services Description Layer, which is an XML format for describing the available services that enables one service to find out the capabilities of other services that are around. Now, these slides are a little bit old. There are lots of other ways of doing these. Um, and WSDL is not the only way that people communicate with each other. Similarly, down at the bottom, the actual information that is the XML, in this case again, this is XML information that is sent around between applications. The middleware converts the data down to XML in this slide into a format called uh, SOAP which is an XML format. It stands for the Simple Object Access Protocol, and it essentially is an XML serialization layer and allows you also to describe what remote methods you wish to call on an object. I should also say that these days you are as likely to find people doing this in JSON or in Google Protocol buffers or in other formats. Um, web sockets and so forth that people write their own things and there are as many different ways of doing this as you would like to try for your particular language etc. But the idea behind your middleware is that it provides some interface like that so that you can find out what the applications are and what the services are and that your application can communicate with different services in some way. So now let's look at particular instances of these middle layer, middleware layers. <clears throat> One of the oldest is called CORBA, which stands for Common Object Request Broker Architecture. So this has been around since, gosh, I don't know. Well, I mean, it was in when I was in industry in the late 90s, it was being used. So it allows you to describe distributed objects and to make calls between them. It is designed to work for different operating systems, to not be programming language specific, or to require any particular computing hardware. There is a description language, an interface description language, or IDL, that allows you to describe objects and explain what type of facilities each object has. And with this interface description language, you can then there are a bunch of little idle compilers. So, for example, you write an idle description for your weather service, which might say uh, this weather object allows you to ask for the weather on a particular date in a particular city. And then it would you would have a compiler for, for example, for C++, which would compile that down to a set of C++ classes that you would then fill in the actual implementation for. Uh, and there would be one of those compilers for uh, pretty much every different language. So, the, the, so, so you have these objects described by these idls, and in order to find what objects there are, there are orbs, object request brokers. So applications <clears throat> initialize an orb and they get an adapter to this which maintains things like reference counting to make sure that when nobody is any longer using an object that it can be uh, disposed of and that the lifetime of this object and the how the garbage will be collected etc are described in a straightforward way that works across different languages. So this object adapter is used to register instances and the these instances are the actual uh, code that has been generated through these stubs. So you run your compiler on the idle, it gives you a stub that 
you can fill in to give your actual code, for example, when it asks when we have an orb, when we have an object giving the uh, the weather on a particular date, etc., then you would do whatever it needs to do to actually discover that from your database and return the information. And then <coughs> you 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 register that object so that it is then available to other uh, other services elsewhere. General structure of Corba looks a little bit like this. You have your object request broker, which knows all about the objects that are around. And the idea behind this slide, at least, is to show that there are different types of objects that you might have. So there are objects that are particular to your application. There are common object services, like, for example, finding out what objects there are. Um, explaining the lifetime of your objects and so forth. And there are horizontal facilities. So when we talk about horizontal and vertical in terms of middleware layers, horizontal means that the facilities are common to all sorts of different uses. Vertical means that they are specific to a particular domain. The kind of things that you might see in horizontal facilities are uh, things that are specific to user interface, information management, task management, and so forth, that are useful across all sorts of different domains. And then vertical facilities might be, sp might be specific to banking or manufacturing and so forth. Corba is uh, a remote object model, so, and it does it in a standard way. So on your client, you have an object which looks to you like the remote object. And this is made easy by having this separate interface def definition language so that the idle compiler will produce for you in one go the server stubs and the client stubs so that client library can clients can load your library and immediately understand how to communicate with your remote object. So the interface definition language has a collection of methods and different in, has multiple interfaces in it, each of which has a collection of methods, and particular objects can say which interfaces they implement. OK, and then we will look at DCOM, I think, in a moment. No, we won't. OK, so DCOM, distributed communication. Here the interfaces can be done at a slightly lower level in form of tables called binary interfaces. And this allows a faster marshalling and slightly more efficient access. So in Corba, we have these various uh, entities that you should know about. The object request broker that connects clients and objects and services together that we've already talked about, or the orb. We have these proxies or skeletons, which are the compiled code that deals with the marshalling and unmarshalling, and then you fill in the gaps to give the actual, um, the actual behavior of the things. And there are also dynamic invocation and skeleton interfaces that allow clients to construct invocation requests at runtime rather than having to know about them at compile time. This is very similar in use to the kind of reflection APIs that you will see in Java, uh, where you don't quite yet know what's there. You want to write some generic piece of code that will work over a variety of objects. For example, if you want to write a user interface which allows people to go and find out what objects are available in their system and to call against them, then you don't know at compile time what objects are available, so you don't at compile time have their interface description, which means that then you would not be able to do that. The dynamic invocation allows you to find those interface descriptions at runtime and to make use of those objects in a slightly more cumbersome and less efficient manner.
but it is essential for some kinds of tasks. The object adapter sits on the server side and handles the invocation requests, does the, uh, does the appropriate things for them and returns the values down through marshalling. There is a repository of interfaces. This is essentially just a database somewhere containing all the interface definitions. And this is what enables the runtime and dynamic interface uh, interfacing that is, as said, similar to Java Reflection. So uh, the, there is also an implementation repository where the code and the state of the objects is kept. And the idea behind this is that by separating these two things out, you can change how they are managed. In general, you would see a diagram that looks a little bit like this. You have your client application, which communicates to the proxy proxies for the different objects that are, exist on the remote server that are created by compilation of the static idl files. Then you have facilities for dynamic invocation, and you have the interface to the orb, which allows you to, for example, find out what objects there are and manage lifetimes, etc. And your client orb does the work of managing all of these together, communicates down to the local operating system. On the server, you have a kind of inverse of this, where the remote objects are actually implemented. They have corresponding skeletons and adapters and a dynamic interface to match up with the client's dynamic invocation interface. And they have their own orb that manages these objects and makes sure that everything goes well. The actual messaging that happens from the client, it wants to call something in one of these objects. So that goes down, as far as the client is concerned, it simply calls the, uh, the particular method in the proxy that it has. That proxy then does the marshalling and unmarshalling down through the orb and sends the request to the server. And when the server responds, then it comes back and calls back into the application. So there are different methods for doing this. You may have the method block until you get a result, or you may have it continue depending on how this works, on, how, on which form you wish to use for your method calls. So uh, that was Corba. And now we look at COM, the component object model technology that uh, Microsoft came up with. Again, it's very old. But it's still around, so you might end up having to interface with it. So this is for Microsoft Windows operating systems to enable them to do distributed uh, computing. Actually, even COM is even used internally in Microsoft uh, Windows to enable different processes on the same machine to communicate with each other. Uh, there is then distributed COM DCOM, which allows you to do things in a distributed manner. So uh, there was COM and then there was ActiveX. There's all sorts of stuff in this, um, in this family of technologies. So uh, there's COM Plus, which is the sort of more modern version of this, distributed COM, DCOM, and ActiveX controls, which, ugh, I mean, I imagine they're still around. Um, they're all rather painful to use, if I remember rightly, when I used to work at Microsoft. So Microsoft now recommends that you use .NET instead of uh, COM and DCOM and all these kind of things because the managed runtime makes life a lot easier and it's just a little bit more modern. But let's have a look at COM anyway, or at some bits of it. So essentially COM and .NET are complementary in that .NET is a language runtime that enables you to do lots of different things and COM enables you is a communication pattern between processes. So the different uh, common .NET applications, if you've got a, something written in C++, for example, using old style COM, nowadays you can, can use 
com to communicate with .NET applications and vice versa. So they can both be used for similar things, but .NET is basically better in every way. And if you have a choice, go for .NET. Then there is COM+. Plus. And COM+, Plus was something that Microsoft came up with for Windows 2000. So you're really seeing the cutting edge here. And it brought together all of the various COM components and uh, things like Microsoft Transaction Server. And the idea was to make it easy for developers to interact with all of these different, um, these different components. Uh, and it provided additional facilities like resource pooling and how to handle it so that you could write essentially an online application that didn't fall over when your internet went down and that users could continue to make progress on work and have everything magically sync back up again when your uh, when your server came when you, when your when your device came back online and doing things like publicate pub sub things publication subscription and distributed transactions and so forth so generally a good set of facilities uh, this thing is still around and dotnet developers can make use of it through enterprise services in the dotnet framework still in the microsoft sphere of things there is dcom this is distributed com and this was Microsoft's way of doing interprocess communication across uh, different machines. It is essentially looks to the world very much like com. You access it in very similar ways, but there is RPC going, remote procedure calls going on under the covers to make the calls on to the remote machines. So it was not quite as uh, full featured as Corba. Uh, one wonders why they didn't just use Corba, but of course, this is why we can't have nice things. And uh, again, it is quite old. Um, so there we go. How does it look? Well, you have uh, a bunch of these different things sitting around in the system. At the bottom, you have the COM libraries that we've talked a little bit about before. And in there, there are things for persistent storage and persistence and creating objects and talking to different processes. And then there are different levels. Now, these things are often uh, user interface. I mean, the, the things that I'm showing you that, that are being shown here from beyond slides are um, user interface level facilities. OLE stands for Object Link Embedding. This was Microsoft's solution to enable you to, for example, stick a spreadsheet inside your Word document and have it live update. So that was uh, linking an object and enabling you to um, interact with them in a very painful way back in the early 2000s. ActiveX are things that lived inside your Internet Explorer browser and did awful things like completely remove all of your security um, whilst making flashing links appear all over the place and so forth. Uh, and they probably had some useful purposes as well. They are not used so much anymore because we have better things. So the DCOM object model uh, looks, as I say, rather similar to the COM object model. You have an interface description, which describes the operations. The, each interface, similar to COM, is typed. And you have unique interface identifiers. By unique, I mean globally unique, so that the object identifiers are chosen in a way which means that they should never clash with anybody else's object identifier, uh, uh, interface identifier anywhere in the world. So the clients request an implementation of an interface, and then it is the job of the uh, DCOM system 
to find an implementation of that interface, create the class, and to manage the lifetime of that object. So in our example that I tried to use before, you might have an interface for uh, weather queries, and you would ask DCOM, please find me a weather queryable interface. And DCOM would be required to go to some database and find a list of machines that can handle that. It would create a stub for you that communicates to that server and return it to you. And when you are done, it would throw it away and inform the remote server that it no longer needs that connection anymore. How does all of this work? From, I mean, the most important thing, I guess, is that you have these idle specifications. We have a bunch of uh, idle to interface compilers that take things down to different languages for you. And essentially, what happens is that if you imagine a, a C struct with a bunch of function pointers that can be filled in, that's really what it looks like. And that becomes then the binary interface. Uh, and uh, sorry, that's I beg your pardon. That's how the binary interface is done, so that you have a, a set of offsets that enable these things to, to actually work. And then for different languages, you have facilities to interact with those in a supposedly natural way. Uh, and there you go. And not entirely dissimilar from other diagrams that we have seen for how these things work. We have the client machine. SCM over here means Service Control Manager, which essentially provides you the ability to find out what services there are and to, to change things to them. Uh, we have uh, your normal COM, uh, your client proxies that are created, and something that will marshal the data around between the uh, proxies. The Microsoft has its own RPC uh, communication protocols that will send information over to the send your requests over to the particular server, and essentially we unmarshal things. We have those object stubs that call back to the actual object that implements the things, and the object server has a similar service control manager to. Uh, know what services are there and to provide registries, etc. So that's DCOM. Microsoft moved to a managed runtime system called .NET um, in the early 2000s, I think. And it is perhaps preferable to use that. So it is a full programming environment with lots of languages that map down to it. It provides a standard way of creating and interacting with web services and for ways for you to create .NET servers that work with everything that you need to do and uh, the implementations work on Microsoft machines unsurprisingly and there is also a not perfect implementation of it called Mono which works on Linux. The idea is that you have a large number of different languages which are compiled down to use a common language specification. Uh, and this is, you, you use Visual Studio because, ugh, well, I don't know, I suppose it's possible. Uh, and underneath all of this, there are lots of different facilities written in whatever language you like that can then be used from your current host language, including VB, although if you have to use VB, it's probably trying to find a bit different job. Uh, and uh, those go down to some common language runtime, which provides the sort of the base services that any just-in-time compiled system needs. Here we have a slightly more detail on that. The language is up at the top common language specification and types and a framework class library which contains your things like um, lists and vectors and hash tables and so forth. And then we have more specific things like 
web forms and XML services, uh, facilities to use Windows and user interface things, consoles so that you can do logging, etc. ASP means Active Server Pages. ADO means is a, your your data access uh, layer. Uh, .NET remoting is clearly enabling you to call remote objects. And underline this, the runtime system has the just-in-time compilers for the different languages that you've got, security facilities, garbage collection, and so forth. All of the things that you would exp that you probably are more aware of from the Java world are provided to multiple languages in .NET. Okay, so .NET communicates with the slightly more modern than DCOM uh, XML format of uh, in information sharing using SOAP, as I previously discussed before. So uh, you send SOAP requests and get SOAP results in uh, different services. So your application over there on the left sends a SOAP request uh, that gets turned down to your web service uh, and it does whatever it needs to do and sends the result back. The services are discovered by WSDL, the Web Services Description layer. Um, SOAP messages are provided are, are sent between services and consumers. The service registry uses UDDI, which stands for the Universal Description Discovery and Integration, which is an XML-based service for describing and publishing and finding web services. .NET uses SOAP and essentially when you make a call to your apparently same language as yourself proxy object, the parameters are marshaled into a SOAP message which is sent across the network and the SOAP message says please call this method on this object with these parameters. .NET deserializes for you th that for you on the web server and calls out to the appropriate bit of the service code. And then the result is packaged back up into a SOAP message, which uh, is sent back over and unpackaged on the client in the exactly straightforward way that you would imagine some further layers of abstraction through the Windows Communication Foundation, WCF, which are used to uh, provide these some extra services, some extra facilities. The idea is that you have a service-orientated architecture where you make use of services in a hopefully transparent way. And clients can use many different services and different services can be used by many different clients. And services communicate with each other in a loosely coupled way and they typically have a web services description interface uh, that enables discovery and understanding of what the different services have. And we have things like web service addressing which provides you a straightforward method of describing which particular web service you wish to, to talk to reliable messaging, which we have talked about in previous lectures, security facilities, uh, discovery, routing and support for REST, and so forth. Okay, so that is .NET and the Windows world. Google has its own needs, and uh, these slides are somewhat old, of course, but uh, there we go. So the Google has um, a communication protocol different from SOAP called Protocol Buffers, which is a binary uh, description language. Well, no, no, so, I mean, they, 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 there is a language that describes binary buffers that are sent across in not a particularly concise fashion, but 
they are quite easy to reason about and they have various useful properties similar to XML, which is that people can come along and add things to it without breaking what you had before and so forth. So essentially what Google decides to do was once they've got these protocol buffers, uh, which has its own idle and its own set of compilers, that they would build their own RPC system around their own protocol buffers. And so that is what they have done, called gRPC. They have lots and lots of facilities built on top of this kind of thing. Uh, so the idea essentially is that it is RPC, but it uses protocol buffers and lots of different languages. And beyond that, it's basically what you would expect from what we have seen in lots of diagrams before. So there we go. That is the last bit for today's lecture. Um, excellent.